So every year we invite our staff to fill out one of those March Madness brackets. Uh, we give away a few prizes. We invite all of our staff to do it. Many of them do. And part of the reason is, yeah, you might win something. You might win bragging rights. And it's kind of just fun to banter back and forth between teams and individuals. How many of you at our campuses participate in March Madness of some sort? You fill out a bracket with friends or whatever. Yeah, there's a few of you. Last night on Saturday, it was like four people. I think they were nervous or something. But uh, so good, I, you know. What, what's interesting is for those of you who aren't filling them out, you probably are thinking to yourself, why would I ever do that? I don't know anything about basketball. I, I don't know anything about any of those teams. It, 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 but what you don't realize is that everyone has the same potential to win. And I fall into this every single year. I mean, I, I take it a little more seriously, do a little bit of research, you know, like which teams are hot, which teams are not. You know, I spend about an hour or so just kind of looking at what kind of ch conference champions, all of this stuff. What are the experts saying? I fill out two brackets because, I, you know, I kind of want to double my chances here of getting it right and inevitably every single year. Just about every single year, the people who know nothing about basketball win the whole thing. So it's crazy, and I fall for it. So if you could do me a favor at our campuses and put your hands together for Sarah Rankins because she won at the West Toledo campus. Way to go. You know, you're the winner. She is self-proclaimed, not really that interested in sports at all, but uh, she was one of the few people who didn't pick Duke to win it all. Wah, wah. So, I, you know, what's fun for me is I invited my kids to do this a few years ago, and I mean, Lydia was like 10, you know, and my, my son was like 7, and you know, and they're like, Lydia was like, ew. You know, I, she could care less about basketball. And then I said, I'll give $5 to the winner of each round. You would think I opened up the Mega Millions lottery to them. They were like, where's the bracket and how do I do it? And give me the rules. And, and so we've been doing this over the past couple of years. And my two boys are into it so much that we were at the final home game of the walleye. And they wanted to go out into the lobby to watch the end of the Duke-Michigan State game because Sam picked Duke and Noah picked Michigan State and five whole dollars was on the line. <laughs> That's the power of potential. I think if you're a Browns fan, it's like potential all over the place. You know, I know, I know there's potential, lots of names in the past, but come on. This time it's for real. I'm on the Super Bowl bandwagon all in. And what's funny is when they drafted Baker Mayfield, I was one of the first people who said, I'm going to quit the Browns. <laughs> it's amazing how that all turned around. Let's not talk about that. Okay. You know, for those of you that, uh, if you've ever played the lottery, isn't that what the lottery is all about? I mean, you have a better chance of getting bitten by a shark from Northwest Ohio, which is, when you think about the number of times that you're in the water, than winning the lottery. You, you know, you're going to have to get struck by lightning twice before you're going to win. And yet, what do we do? <laughs> When it's, especially, you know, sometimes even for me, it's kind of fun when it's at the like super mega millions, you go and buy a ticket and you just wonder about the potential of what could be in the rest of the year you could care less. I mean, we experience this in many areas of our life. I mean, let me ask you a question. Why do you go to Target? Be honest. Because potentially there's something in there that you didn't know that you had. That's the amazing thing about potential. Wherever it is that you shop, why we pursue relationships that we pursue, where we want to go to college, what we're hoping our degree is, the new job that we're going to take, the new house that we're going to move into. All of this is this quest for potential. And potential's not bad. It's just sometimes we give it more priority in our life. That's why this week I want to talk about this bottom line. If you're taking notes, you can write it down. It's that your purpose matters more than your potential. I'm going to say it again, your purpose actually matters more than your potential. And some of you are like, huh? Because our tendency is to use these two words synonymously as if they mean the same thing. Like you need to live up to your potential. You have so much potential. And yes, they're related, but they are not even close to being the same thing. I'm not saying that one is bad and the other is good. It's just that your purpose matters more than your potential. And so let's talk about what they mean. Here's your potential. It's what is possible. Potential are all of the possibilities that are in front of you. And I'm not saying that that's bad. It's not bad to think about your potential. It's not bad to dream about your potential and think about all of the possibilities. But what's interesting is that potential is determined 
by the eye of the beholder what they think is possible with you and what you think is possible with you, which gives you an infinite amount of potential possibilities. What's purpose on the other hand? Purpose is what you were made to do. It's not everything that's possible. It's what is unique to you. So, so as we think about these two things and we think about how your purpose matters more than your potential, I want you to consider this. Did Jesus fulfill his potential? Now, I know some of you are like, uh, well, if I say no, I'm in church. Will the building fall down? You know, it's like if somebody comes back from the dead, that's pretty freaking cool. So, regard, but think about it. If potential is in the eye of the beholder, has he fulfilled every possibility for every person? I mean, for some of you, this is the tension that you have with even the idea of surrendering your life to him is because maybe you prayed a prayer or you asked him to help or, or, you've, or you've, you've hoped that Jesus would allow a different outcome in your life, a different potential possibility, and it didn't happen. And so you're like, can I trust him? I mean, think about it. When Jesus walked the earth, did he heal every person? N- no, he, he didn't. So that means he did not fulfill all that was possible. Did he fix the corrupt Roman uh, religious institution? No. Did he overthrow Rome like many of the Jewish people around him wanted to do, that that, that believed the Messiah would do? The answer is no. Think about Palm Sunday, what this weekend represents in the story of Jesus. It was hundreds and thousands of people coming down to lay palm branches down, declaring Jesus, Hosanna. They were They were excited about his potential, and Jesus blew it all off. Why? Because he knew that his purpose mattered more than his potential. And I think the same is true for every single one of us. You see, you can spend your whole life chasing potential and miss your purpose. Some of you have already wasted too many years chasing what your mom, dad, hoped you would become, fulfilling their dream for you, instead of living out what you were made to do. Some of you are caught up in what your friends want you to do at school or in life. Some of us get caught in what the potential that culture puts in front of us. You can chase potential your whole life and miss your purpose, miss what you were made to do, but but your purpose reveals your true potential. Not all that is possible, but the potential that is true for you when you begin to understand what you were made to do. And there's a story that I think uniquely explores the tension that we feel when it comes to our potential, when it comes to what is possible in our life And uh, we're going to follow the chronology that we've been walking through over the past couple of weeks. Two weeks ago, I talked about Caiaphas, the high priest, versus Jesus. And how following Jesus is going to cost you, but fighting him will cost you more. And Caiaphas was way too threatened by the cost of following Jesus, so he decided to fight him instead. Last week, Josh talked about Jesus versus Judas when Judas betrayed him. And also when Peter betrayed him. And how oftentimes we get stuck in pain. And pain isn't the place that determines our life. It's what we do with that pain. God wants to give that pain a what? A purpose. And so this week I want to explore this idea that your purpose matters more than your potential. By looking at the next significant story. And that's Jesus versus Pilate. You may recognize Pilate. He's the Roman governor who put Jesus on trial. And and, and if you've ever read the story, I, I mean, you may, under, you may have understood it the first time through, but it is very confusing and difficult to actually find the significance in. It really just seems like some weird, inept Roman governor, a bloodthirsty mob, some weirdo criminal named Barabbas, and a hand washing is what sentenced Jesus to death. And instead, what I want to do is I want to look at, I mean, you may be familiar with the story, but I want to think about Jesus versus Judas and the conversation that they have. Because I think within that conversation, if we could just be a fly on the wall and understand some of the context that sets this up, we're going to be able to identify with Pilate and the tension he feels around his potential 
And I think we're going to learn something from Jesus that may change some of the perspectives that you have in your life. In order to help set the stage, I need to give a little historical context to make this make sense. And for those of you that like history, you'll enjoy it. For those of you that are, didn't come for history class today, I just kind of journey along with me because this will help set the stage. You see, Pilate became the governor of this tumultuous area of Judea, Jerusalem and Caesarea, not all of modern day Israel, but just a portion of it at around 26 AD. And he's a kind of a rising star because they needed to put some of their best governors in this region that was prone to have civil uprisings and messiahs and they were trying to overthrow Rome. Now Jerusalem, the, the Jews were allowed to practice their religion as long as they didn't disrupt what the nation of Rome wanted to do. And this was a critical area between Egypt and the rest of Europe. And so when Pilate came in, he was like, all right, boys, new sheriff's in town. And he tried to exert his authority early on by bringing statues called effigies and standards like the Roman flag and symbols of Caesar into Jerusalem, specifically into the temple area, the most sacred place of the Jewish faith where there is to be no graven image. And of course, this makes all of the religious leaders delightfully happy. No, they're ticked. And so they start to rise up and complain and push back. And so at one point, Pilate calls the gathering with all these leaders. And he says, listen, I'm the new sheriff in town. You do what I say. I've got the power here. You follow me. And if not, by the way, gentlemen, I've surrounded this building with Roman soldiers. And they're ready to execute you if you don't follow. And do you know what all of these religious leaders did? It says that they bared their necks. And they said, we'd rather you kill us than violate Mosaic law. They called us bluff. And so now... Pilate is dealing with a potential embarrassment, a potential threat, while at the same time dreaming about his potential future within the Roman Empire. So as a little time goes by, the Roman Empire wants an aqueduct delivering fresh water into Jerusalem. Pilate needs to pay for it. He takes money from the temple treasury. This makes the religious leaders furious. And so they start rising up again. They write a letter to Tiberius, the emperor of Rome, and they send And then Tiberius, Pilate's boss, sends a letter back. And he's like, you got to cool it, man. I sent you here to keep the peace, not make it chaotic. And so here, Pilate again is feeling threatened by this potential of this group. At one point, he wanted to put eagles around the temple mount area, the city, the, the wall around the temple. And this created civil uprisings in Jerusalem and Caesarea. People are losing their life. Chaos ensues. And again, Pilate feels threatened by this whole thing. And he's sick and tired of these religious leaders. So imagine his delight as the gospel accounts of Jesus' life record. Imagine Pilate's delight when the religious leaders show up early in the morning. And they're only there because they need Pilate's help. I mean, this might be Pilate's best day. It's early in the morning. I don't know if it's 4, 5, 6, 7 a.m., but they come knocking on Pilate's door. A servant answers, uh, who's there? Religious leaders, we need Pilate. We need his help to execute someone. Can, can you imagine Pilate like in his bathrobe? And cup, I mean, he didn't have a bathrobe, but he bathrobe, cup of coffee, comes walking out, and look at what happens. Pilate, the governor, went out to them and asked, what's your charge against this man? <laughs> It's like he's, why are you waking me up so early? What, what is it that you really need from me? What, what, do you even have a charge? I mean, are you here on legitimate grounds? And here's their reply. We wouldn't have handed him over to you if he weren't a criminal, they retorted. That word is like they're agitated. They're angry. They hate it that they have to show up and ask a Roman officer for a favor. I mean, it's like, I'd rather get my teeth drilled out at the dentist, although they didn't have that back then. You know, it's like, I would rather do anything than be here right now. And look at how Pilate replies. He loves this so much. He's like, well, if he's a problem for you, you take him away and judge him by your own law. I imagine that when he says this, he's like, you take him away and judge him by your own law. And turns around and walks back out. And here's how they reply. Well, only Romans are permitted to execute someone, the Jewish leaders replied. Can you see it? Pilate's like walking away. You do it on your own, walking away. <laughs> He's like, only, oh, only what? Could you repeat that for me again? Oh, who's allowed to execute? Whose help do you need? Only who? Roman, only oh, me. You came here asking for a favor from me. Oh, this is beautiful and delicious. <laughs> so what does he do? 
He leaves him there. He leaves him there, and then he goes inside, went back into his headquarters, and then sent a messenger out. I mean, it's like he's making him wait and kick the dirt with Jesus standing there, awkward silence. He called for Jesus to be brought in. He wants to question him without the rest of the leaders around, and he said, are you the king of the Jews, he asked them. What's he doing here? I mean, initially, he's evaluating the threat of this person who's been accused of being a king. He's trying to feel this unique individual out. And there's no doubt that he had probably heard of Jesus. Most likely he heard of Palm Sunday Road. But his initial impression is, I don't really know what to make of this guy. You know what else Pilate is doing? He's thinking, what's the potential leverage I can get out of him? That's why he called him inside. How could, I, how could I use him to milk this moment for all that it's worth? And Jesus, what I love about Jesus is he never answers questions directly. Oftentimes he gives another question. He replies, is this your own question or did, you tell other, or did others tell you about me? Essentially, Jesus is trying to get Pilate to wrestle with the question that we all should wrestle with. And that's, it's like he's looking at Pilate saying, Who do you say that I am? Or are you just telling me what other people have told you to tell me? Are you just telling me what your parents told you? Are you just using my name because you feel like you should? Or or who do you say that I am? And Pilate wants none of this. I mean, he basically, am I a Jew? Pilate retorted, your own people and their leading priests brought you to me for a trial. Why? What, focus, what have you done? What is it that you're here for? You're claiming to be this king, but what's the real issue? I'm giving you a chance to clear your name. I'm giving you a chance to protect your potential future. What is it that you've done? And here's what Jesus says. He says, my kingdom is not an earthly kingdom. If it were, my followers would fight to keep me from being handed over to the Jewish leaders, but my kingdom is not of this world. If this were an earthly kingdom, he said, my followers would not fight. In other words, there's no chaos, there's no riots in the street, there's no no one attacking anyone here. I'm made for something different that's not of this world. And Pilate can't understand that. He comes back to the question, are you a king? Well, what is it that you're doing? What's this really all about? And Jesus is trying to help him. He says, you say that I'm a king. Actually, I was born. I was made and came into the world. To what? This is what I was made to do, is what Jesus is saying. To testify to the truth. And all who love the truth recognize what I say is true. Pilate looks, listens to all of this. He's like, what is the truth? Pilate asked. And Jesus said, you can't handle the truth. Just kidding. That's where the conversation ended. What's interesting to me is Pilate is trying to figure out what Jesus is really all about. And Jesus keeps answering who he was made to be. And when he starts talking about who he was created to be, what he came to do, what his purpose is, To testify to the truth, Pilate's like, what's the truth? I think that's because the truth is elusive when you're looking at life only through the lens of potential. The truth is elusive. You can't see what truly matters. You can't really see clearly what the perfect path, the best potential path to take is. It's why people wrestle over which job, which career, what decisions that we can make. Why? Because when you only look through what is possible, there's a lot of possibilities with everything. This is why sometimes when we look at ourselves in the mirror, we do a terrible job of evaluating ourselves truthfully. Sometimes we look at ourselves and we are way too harsh, way too judgmental. You'll never amount to anything. Nobody loves you. You're terrible. You'll never accomplish anything great. Or on the other side, we're way too tolerant about things that we're doing. We're like, oh yeah, I'll fix that next week, next year. It doesn't matter right now. It's not really hurting anyone. It's not a big problem. And so we convince ourselves that our destructive patterns that we're engaging in are okay. And you know what's wrong with both of those paths? Whether you're too harsh or too tolerant, you're deceiving yourself. You can't see the truth. Why? Because potential focuses on asking what What's the best opportunity? What path should I take? What's the biggest risk? What's going to be the best for me? 
What's going to cause the most pain? Purpose instead asks who questions. Who am I created to be? Who am I becoming? Who has God put in my life to make a difference? Those questions are far more significant. They matter more. Your purpose matters more than your potential. But if we could reverse the order and ask, who has God created me to be? Then we know what our true potential is. When we ask, who am I becoming? Then we can ask, what is the best step for, to help me grow in this? When we go, who has God invited me to make a difference? And then we ask, what should I do here? Your purpose matters more than your potential. But Pilate can't see it. He can't see it. That's why he's like, what's the truth, man? I got the potential with Rome. I got this potential chaos. I got you, this potential king. I got my own feelings and all here. And so here's what he does. He goes out to all of the leaders. Leaves, I think he leaves Jesus behind. He might have brought Jesus back out with him. And he says to the crowd, hey, every year at Passover, I release a prisoner of your choosing. And so you pick. How about we release this uh, king of the Jews that's a problem for you? And I, I can't tell if he's just continuing to leverage his authority over the crowd or if he's really troubled over this guy that he feels is innocent. He, he doesn't quite understand. The crowd shouts back that they want Barabbas, this known insurrectionist, this terrorist, to be released. And then they start asking for Jesus to be crucified. And so Pilate's like, all right, time out. I'll have him flogged. He has him flogged. Cat of nine tails, leather strips with bone, glass, different pieces of metal in it. It would have made him look so, excuse me, torn up that your stomach would turn at the sight of him. I mean, he would have been beaten beyond recognition. And so after this is done, Pilate comes back outside again and says to the people, I'm going to bring him out to you now, but understand clearly that I find him not guilty. What's he thinking? If he's really a threat, you're going to see that he's not a threat any longer. I don't think that he's guilty. I don't think that he's guilty. I'm doing everything that I can to make you happy, but not kill an innocent man. Because they, they didn't value that at all. But here's how they were when Jesus came out, wearing a crown of thorns and a purple robe. Pilate said, look, here's the man. He didn't say, look, here's the king. He, he was talking. He's just, he's just a man. He's not a threat. And when they saw him, look at how the crowd, the leading priests and temple guards began to shout, crucify him, crucify him. It's like Pilate is blown away. A man that he, now he's troubled because a man that he thinks is innocent and what he was hoping would give him leverage over these leaders. He's like, I can't figure out what's going on. So what does he try to do? He says, take him yourselves and crucify him. I find him not guilty. It's at this point where the Jewish leaders say, by our law, he ought to die because he called himself the son of God. This is their real issue with Jesus. And once they say this, when Pilate heard this, he was more frightened than ever. Why? Because Romans, in general, are extremely superstitious. I mean, you got to ask the question, why did Rome allow the Jewish people to continue practicing their religion? Because they were superstitious. They thought, as long as you are civilized citizens, we'll let you practice your religion just in case your God is just as powerful as some of the gods that we worship, and we don't want to tick them off. We want him to help us accomplish our goal. They were so superstitious that when Pilate heard that this is the son of God, he called a little time out. Why? Because the potential threat that Jesus could be for him regarding the gods, he didn't want to mess with. What, what another account records is that earlier in the trial, Pilate's wife came out and interrupted the trial, sent a servant or a messenger to say, let this innocent man go. He was the source of terrible dreams for me last night. And so at this point, the potential threat to Pilate begins to creep up and look at what he does. He took Jesus back into his headquarters, him and Jesus, and he asks him, okay, now wait a second, where are you from really? He's trying to figure out who this Jesus is. Jesus gave no answer. He's like, why don't you talk to me, Pilate demanded. He's throwing a fist on the table. Don't you realize that I have the power to release you or crucify you? Can't you see my potential? Don't you realize what's at stake for you? 
Can't you see how important this conversation is and you're not talking to me? In other words, aren't you worried about your potential? In other words, why aren't you worried about your potential? In Pilate's mind, most men would be begging for their lives right now. They'd be doing anything that they could because of what they had already been through. And yet here's what Jesus said. He said, you would have no power over me at all unless it were what? Given to you from above. So the one who handed me over to you has the greater sin. This is the phrase. Pilate, you'd have no power unless it was given to you from above. Pilate was pleading to Jesus around his potential and Jesus replied with a clarity of purpose. Jesus didn't have to play the same potential game because he knew what he was made to do and his potential did not matter as much as his purpose. You see, purpose in our life strives, it tries, it seizes, and it is motivated by fear. Because if I don't, it won't. And so we strive our life to try to capture all of our potential. Where the starting place for purpose is trust. It's a posture where you have to open your hands and go, okay, God, what did you make me to do? What was I designed to do? Who am I becoming here? I think that's why potential is so alluring to us because it feels like something that we can make. It feels like something that we can build. It feels like something that we can control. And we love control. We love the appearance of control. That's why it's so devastating when we feel like we lose control. Unless we live open-handedly with our purpose. Our purpose is not something that you decide, not something that you make, it's not something that you build, it's something that you receive. And then it's ultimately your decision about whether you're going to be faithful to your purpose or are you going to try to find your potential somewhere else. That's the tension here. So Pilate goes back out. He tries to release Jesus again. But the Jewish leaders shouted, If you release this man, you are no friend of Caesar. And anyone who declares himself a king is a rebel against Caesar. This is where the tables turn. Pilate started the whole conversation feeling like he had potential leverage over the Jewish religious leaders. And after he tried to release Jesus a third time, they are blackmailing him now. Essentially, they're saying, hey, if you don't release him, if you don't release him, we're going to write your boss, and your boss is going to come back and tell you that, man, you let an enemy of the empire go, <laughs> you're going to go. Because everybody knew that people who declared themselves king were going to pay for it, be made a, a public show on the cross. And so when they said this, Pilate brought Jesus out to them again. And Pilate sat down on the judgment seat on the platform that is called the stone pavement. It was now about noon on the day of the preparation of Passover. Early in the morning until noon. This took place over a few hours, right? And Pilate said to the people, look, here is your king. And their reply, away with him, they yelled. Away with him, crucify him. Pilate holding on to a thread of potential hope. What? Crucify your king, Pilate asked. And their reply, we have no king but Caesar, the leading priest. The leading priests shouted back. This is crazy talk. I mean, have you ever had an encounter with someone in your life where it's like, it's like the breakup with Jennifer Aniston and Vince Vaughn, where it's like, you thought you were talking about this, you thought you were, and then all of a sudden this came out of nowhere. I mean, this happens with kids. If you have like young kids all the time, when they get hungry, angry, and tired, you never know what's going to come out of their mouth. You ask them to clean up the toys that they spilled all over the place, and they start to whine, and then pretty soon they're saying things back to you like, you hate me, you think I'm terrible, and you're like, where did this come from? I mean, just this past week, Mary, our three-nager, 
Yeah, it's, it's a real thing, okay. Mary our three nature threw the Scrabble pieces all over the floor and I asked her to clean them up. And do you know what she did? She left the room, turned around, walked into the kitchen, looked at my wife, and she went, ugh, daddy ruins everything in my life. <laughs> three nature. <laughs> That's it. And all I did was ask her to clean up Scrabble. I mean, this is what Pilate is thinking when he hears from the leading priest this phrase. We have no king but Caesar, the leading priest shouted back. And he's like, wait a second, you're the same priest. You're the same leaders that were bearing your necks over the fact that I was bringing statues of Caesar near the temple. You're the same priest that were upset that Caesar wanted to use, or I, Rome, wanted to use your money for an aqueduct. You're the same people who didn't want eagles or anything around this. You, you don't even want to acknowledge him as king. You struggle with that. And now he's the only king you have. And so at this point, thinking about his potential, what could be possible, where this crazy crowd is at, he's sitting on a judgment seat and it's time for him to make a decision. And what's motivating his decision is purely potential. And so Pilate washes his hands to try to play all party lines, to try to keep it safe, to minimize the potential risk in any area. He washes his hands and then turns Jesus over to them to be crucified. I find it a bit ironic that Pilate is sitting on a judgment seat judging the Son of God. And while he's doing it, Pilate is trying to minimize his risk, his potential risk, while Jesus is potentially willing to risk it all because of his purpose. Pilate is trying to wash his hands of the situation. Jesus is willing to surrender his hands to be stretched out. Pilate is trying to save his life while the savior he needs is offering his life right in front of him. Why? So that people like Pilate and you and me can escape from the prison of potential alone and we can begin to ask a more important question. What is your purpose? And don't get focused on the what. Ask who has God made me to be? Who am I becoming? You see, what we need to remember is the one who made you, the one who saved you, is the one who gave you, every single one of you, a who to impact. God has actually put inside of every one of us a dream to be useful, to fulfill a purpose. And the problem is we get caught up in all of the what's. What if I'm not good? What if it doesn't work? What if they don't like it? What if this isn't? What if, what, 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 what? Potential, 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 potential. And we miss who God created us to be. We miss who we are becoming and we miss the who, the people that are around us. And that's what I love about our church. Honestly, that's what I love about Easter. Is the powerful opportunity it gives each of us, no matter where you're at in the spiritual journey, to be used by God to impact someone else's life. Maybe even to change, help change their eternal identity. Sometimes we just need to be reminded of the question that matters more than our potential. What's your purpose? To help us see that, recently I experienced the story of Amber, who was extended an invite to a Cedar Creek service. And I want you to hear how that invite story went and how God used it to change your life. Um, so I have a twin sister, her name is Ashley. We did not grow up in the church at all, but when my sister met her husband about 12 years ago, 
Aaron. Aaron and his family was very religious, and so they introduced Ashley to religion and to the church. And she, so she attended and she got baptized, and she's an active uh, member of her church. Um, my sister has invited me to church many times. Um, she carefully invited me because at that time, religion and really any discussion of God turned me off, and you know, I. I closed up and I really didn't want anything to do with it. So last Easter, her and her family were in town for the holiday. And so she looked up the churches in this area and found Cedar Creek. She again invited me. I politely declined and that was that. There was no more discuss discussion. She knew, she knew the boundaries that were set. Um, and then she came home and had her phone. She actually took some pictures and took some videos and she was showing me. And honestly, the music is what interested me initially. And so she, again, asked if we would go to Cedar Creek with her the next weekend. She would even come in town to, to go with us. And I said, yes. So that next weekend is when um, myself, my husband, and my children, and my sister came in from out of town, and again, we went to Cedar Creek. Um, but the series right after Easter was a Finally Free series, and it touched me, and I wanted to keep coming back. The little experience I had in church was just the old-fashioned, traditional, um, organ-type hymn. I had no idea that churches had music like Cedar Creek does. I had no idea. So the finally free um, service, I attended the whole four weeks, so the whole series. Um, ben just talked about um, overcoming your past and any fears and any pain. And when you accept God, um, you will feel free and feel peaceful. And um, that really hooked me and that's what I wanted. I um, am in the process of completing Growth Track. I've been through the first three classes. Um, it's been great. I'm learning more and more about God and about the church and um, what Cedar Creek as a church believes and that I agree with as well. Uh, the third class, we took the pretty lengthy um, questionnaire and that was interesting to get to know um, myself and what I matched up with. And it's a whole lot different from my first service here at Cedar Creek to now um, I attend church uh, most every week. That's when I realized I could feel God's presence and that's when I wanted more. So I decided to get baptized February 2nd of this year. My sister actually told me this. I didn't know this, but when my sister attended Cedar Creek um, on Easter weekend, um, she actually filled out a prayer card praying, um, asking for prayers for her sister, myself, and her family to join Cedar Creek and to, you know, know God. And um, actually the next week after, she filled out another prayer card. So that was pretty cool. I didn't know that. And um, um, right after I got baptized, she was praying for me and she said she's been praying for this moment for 10 years. So that was pretty amazing. That's amazing. You can give that a, uh, I hate it. that. I, I hope you did not miss the significance of that story. One year ago, not interested in God, like, like zero. And because her sister understood her purpose, she prayerfully, graciously, persistently focused on the who's in her life, inviting them to know God through service. And what did she do? She showed clips of what a Cedar Creek service was like. Now you understand or reminded of why we do what we do. Why we create environments like this. I'm not saying this is the only way to do church. Some people prefer a traditional church environment. But man, we get pumped about creating this kind of space to introduce people to Jesus. And I think there is nothing that excites the heart of God more than when someone who was like, er, on him suddenly says yes to the spiritual journey. I think sometimes for us, there's this gravitational pull in the church back to what, what does it do for me? 
instead of who has he invited me to bring? Sometimes we want the church experience to be personal, like we're known and that's important and that's valuable and that's good. Or sometimes we want it to be informational. It's st- I need to hear things that get me to think or new or fresh. I've never heard that before. I'm not saying that that's bad. Other times we want it to be emotional where I feel something when I come inside. And I'm not saying that that's all bad either. But Jesus was explicitly clear with his followers. He said to go into the world and make disciples of all nations. It's not personal. It's not just informational. It's not just emotional. No, our focus is to be missional in the life that he's given us. Focus on your purpose. Instead of worrying about the potential, what if they say that? Well, that could be a risk, and I'm not sure what they're. Would you be willing, like Jesus, to risk it all in order to live out the purpose that He's invited us into? I mean, that's what we have in front of us at Easter. It's one of those unique times during the year where people might be more likely to say yes. And so you sit in a seat of judgment today. You're at a decision point. And you're going to decide how the next few days go. If you're going to get caught up in what I have to do for school and what I have to do for work and what my friends are going to think about me and what I want to do and what I don't want to do that I have to do. Or in the midst of all of the what's, you could choose to focus on who God has put in front of you to live out your purpose. See, I I believe... The reason that this is so important, not just for you and for the people that you know, is that everything Northwest Ohio needs to thrive is already here. God sees the purpose that's buried in the hearts of people all over the place. And when they begin to walk on that spiritual journey of knowing him and finding freedom from the trap of potential mistakes, sin, and shame, they begin to clarify and see that God's put a purpose inside of them. And that purpose is to make a difference. And so if we want marriages to thrive, if we want families to thrive, if we want addiction to stop and suicides to go away, do you know how we do that? We invite people, to, we introduce people to Jesus and the spiritual journey that he has for them. And so let's not waste the purpose and the potential that sits right in front of us. I'm gonna ask you to pray a bold prayer. And it's God, will you use me and help me see who you want me to invite? In fact, I'm gonna invite you to do that right now in the seat that you sit. If you want to, just open up your hands. Leave them open-handed, ready to receive, to trust that God has a purpose for all of us. No matter who you are, stay-at-home mom, working 60 hours, student, whether you're a minimum wage employee, make great living, whether you're chronically ill, even if you're watching in a prison cell right now, God has a purpose for you. And so tell him, God, use this, say this prayer in the quietness of your heart. God, use me to make a difference. I'm open-handed. And help me see who, all of the who's that you want me to invite this next week. If there's the name of someone in your life, a brother, a sister, a parent, a son, a neighbor, a coworker, a friend, that you've been thinking about inviting or that God's put in your heart, would you just pray for that name right now? God, I pray for TJ, for Eric and Katie, for Jim, and for the half a dozen or so other people in my life that I've been inviting and the countless others that are being lifted to you right now. God, would you use us to make a difference? And would you help set us free from the lies that potential speaks that we're not enough where we get caught up in all of the what's and the worries that come with it. And God, instead, would you help us focus on who you made us to be, on who we are becoming and who you want us to invite, on who you are to us. And let that guide us to celebrate your victory this Easter. God, all along the way, we will give you all of the praise and the glory for what you accomplish in the lives of us and the people around us. And we pray this in Jesus' amazing name, powerful name. And everyone said, 
Amen. Thanks.